Oh. No, no, because it's now out of the race. It's staying right. in the pits uh, ever since then. Uh, we're live from trackside at Daytona International Speedway. It's 107.9 FM at the track, RS2 IMSA radio across the USA and around the world. We've now had 16 hours of racing, leaving a mere eight to go. And the next hour of racing starts now. And as we go into the 17th hour, Johnny, another fastest lap by Andrea Caldarelli. He's knocked another two tenths off the previous one. 145.3 now his best. And that car's best for the race. This is the Paul Miller Racing number 48, Lamborghini, heading GT Daytona. And his lead stretched now to 56 and a half seconds. The sound in the background is that of a 4.2 litre flat six Porsche engine. It belongs to the 912 driven by Lawrence Vanto. Drivers champion with Earl Bamba last year. Porsche taking the Manufacturers Championship and the... Oh, man, he's hammering that inside kerb on the entry. I think Lawrence now has decided Right, I've had enough of this. I'm going to have to try and take some liberties to get somewhere close to Jesse Cron. Pit lane speed violation for the number 85 car, Chris Miller. Plus 30? Wow. 30 clicks over the top of the speed limit. That's going to be a stop and hold. Yep, stop and 20 second hold for the JDC 85 car. Very costly for the bright yellow Cadillac DPI. Porsche just seemed to get uh, closer into turn number one. And yeah, strong on the brakes, but the BMW gets good traction off the curb, uh, off the turn. There was a bit of a squirm there from the big M8 as well, the number 24 car. 911 entering the international horseshoe now. And that is the car oh. driven by Nick Tandy. So 10.7 seconds. That's He's also being chased by Tonio Garcia, who's only six and a half seconds adrift. Although, John, you reckon that gap's actually growing? Yeah, that was, uh, it was 5.8 seconds last time around. It's 6.5 now. And that's courtesy of a 143.2 from Tandy. He's taken a good seven tenths out of the two cars ahead of him. That's the first time the gap's been under 11 seconds since I've been taking note of it. And Nick Tandy. Andy then, we said that he'll be pushing hard, and he certainly is at the moment. Tonio Garcia heading on to NASCAR turn one and two. Still that Corvette with the afterburners, the Bunsen burners. It's been causing a, a lot of chat on social media and a huge amount of screen grabs and pictures of that. Brand new engine position for the Corvette and a brand new engine, of course, double overhead cam rather than the pushrod V8, flat plane crank, very different sound, but still normally aspirated. They have not gone to turbocharging, but it did look like an engine or maybe an oil problem, oil pump problem. Really late downshift from Vantour into turn one there. He was coping with the back end of the Porsche moving around. What a stint this has been for these two drivers, Johnny. You know, we often say, don't we, in sports car racing, you know, if you're somewhere like Le Mans, you can be pretty much four and a half miles apart, but racing as hard as you if you were wing mirror to wing mirror and trading tenths of seconds. Well, they're not four and a half miles apart. They've been about a second down a half a second or three tenths apart, but they might as well be racing side by side because they are leaving absolutely nothing on the table right now. Yeah, Van Tor will be working out where the BMW strengths are. He probably worked that out uh, several hours ago and uh, also possibly adjusting various routes into the horseshoe. One or two people noting that Macha Jamine tends to square off the second of the horseshoes. Van Tor, I think, less so. Uh, but uh, trying to get as best drive as possible off turn six, which is then the long straight down into the chicane, but it's then losing big chunks of time out through speedway turns three and four, and therefore the Porsche is not in a position to attack when they get back down to turn one again.
Just looking at the steering wheel on the Porsche 911 RSR 19 earlier on this week, there are 16 different control surfaces on that, on that steering wheel. It's pretty much a prototype looking steering wheel and very similar to what was on the 919 hybrid. Now, all the usual bits and pieces for radio and lights flash and drinks button and changing the modes. Two different traction control settings, which Porsche have had for quite a, lo a long time, TCI and TCO. Uh, and basically that's the level of traction control and how much slip angle you can allow for the car or how much slip of the wheels you can occur. It's very clever. Uh, four different rotary controls, one on each thumb and one on the top of either side of the steering wheel, or the steering yoke as it is, because it's not a circle by any stretch of the imagination. No. But the thing that really, really caught my eye, paddle shifters, of course, which you can just tap with a finger, and you can feel the micro switch working very positively. Great tactile feedback. And above that, another set of paddles, just big enough for your first finger of each hand, Brake balance, up and down, on the steering wheel. Never have to take your hands off. Pops up on the dash as to how you've adjusted that front to back. So in theory, Johnny, the Porsche drivers could be changing their brake bias corner by corner. Yes, yeah, because of the ease of use yes. that you can do it. Extraordinary. Yeah. And I said to the drivers, you know, what's all this about? And Lauren said, we are in a class where tiny little incremental differences can be the difference between winning and losing a race. So if that, if that gives us half a tenth here and a tenth there, then we have to use it. So you can't just drive around blithely not touching any of these settings. You've got to be in tune with the car and make these changes on the steering wheels. A handbook for the steering wheel itself that is more than 40 pages long. Wow. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure many of the drivers had to do a bit of cramming uh, <laughs> before they even got started. But also, it's the ability to, to know where the car is ineffective and know then to know which direction you need to go on brake bias um, to, to, to do that on the fly. Uh, so, yeah, that's so tr tricky to do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, again, in awe of all these drivers, really, to be able to make that adjustment. First of all, to know what's wrong, and then to be able to do it whilst you're also nego negotiating the racetrack. Amazing stuff. They have to be not quite engineers as well, but uh, uh, race setup guys as well as very quick uh, pilots too. Two LMP2s. Sorry, one LMP2 and one DPI heading out of the bus stop chicane. Tricky to tell from this distance, but it's the wheel and engineering car, I reckon, going around the outside of one of the LMP2s, the five Oricas. And it goes, they go over the line now. So that was the Dragon Speed car being lapped by the 31 of Felipe Nasa. 15 seconds, the gap for NASA to Tristan Nunez, Cadillac to Mazda. And down a couple of gears again for Belgian Laurence Van Tour. Nick Tandy in third, fourth position in GTLM, Antonio Garcia. Still only talking about 16, 17 seconds between the top four GTLM cars. So Nick Tandy is certainly bridging that gap now between Tonio Garcia and Laurent Van Tour because the 10 second gap that we mentioned last time is now down to eight and a half seconds and it's growing back to Tonio Garcia. But when you add those increments together, it's really only 17, possibly 18 seconds between first placed GTLM car and the fourth place car. Alessandro Pierguidi for Risi Competizione uh, is now a lap off the pace, it would appear, for all the GTLMs. 33 laps completed. 
actually no not quite a lap so still just the lead lap for the Italian in the Risi Competizione 488 Colton Herter in the second of the BMWs car 25 is several laps down though after a couple of significant problems for the 25 early on in the race so 13 laps down on Alessandro Pier Guidi and really out of the fight in GTLM there's now a Lexus between the two GTLM leaders that's the 14 car weaving right and left the racetrack side of the pit wall and then the driver of the 14 who on this occasion is Jack Hawksworth gives Lawrence Van Tor the required space to just slip up the inside into the international horseshoe right hand sorry left hand kink next and then back on the brakes they go for a very similar hairpin bend before they'll line up uh, their cars for turn six which Jesse Crone struggled with not too long ago just to ditch hooking the curb effectively getting the wheels over that lip which is on the uh, the outer edge of the curb but uh, much more a uh, much safer way through turn six now which for the tires will far more enjoy 0.8 of a second between the black BMW and the first of the nine uh, 11 Porsches Viz Patel listening where you are Viz but uh, makes a very good point about that Porsche steering wheel and the brake bias. He says, I imagine adjusting the brake bias helps out as a fuel loads go down, particularly in a Porsche, given how sensitive the car is to porpoising at the front just with the transfer of weight front to back. It's a good point. George, uh, George Eardis says, it's going to be an interesting midweek motorsport on Wednesday with everything that's happening right now, both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, live from the Bathurst press room on uh, Wednesday evening. Will we even have time to talk about the Bathurst 12 hour, I wonder? <laughs> I think Creelsey will make sure that we do. He'll force his way in. Plus we'll have a pit walk as uh, Creelsey takes one of the team walkabout up the pit lane for the Bathurst 12 hours. We'll get that done as well for you as well. Dave Alcock says, I think a smidge of overtime on Wednesday. Hmm. 8 o'clock UK time, that's 3 o'clock on the Eastern Seaboard. Lots of things to pick on up on after this weekend, I think. And keep your comments coming in at IMSA Radio, hashtag IMSA Radio D24. Convergence, ACO, WEC, IMSA with a common set of regulations and potentially a common platform not a single spec car that should be made absolutely clear not a single spec car four different manufacturers and the opportunity uh, four different chassis manufacturers and the opportunity for automotive manufacturers to add their own styling to the cars much as they do right now with the dpis and engines very interesting concept the DPI came up with from uh, IMSA what a couple of years ago now using a commercially available LMP2 chassis and then effectively allowing manufacturers to change the bodywork well, actually written in the regulations that the bodywork had to have styling cues from the manufacturers that they represented and when you look at the front of that Acura you can absolutely see mm. I mean it, it's not identical to an NSX but there's this you go oh yeah yeah okay I can see that it has the face doesn't it yeah and it's the same with the Cadillac the wheels yeah. on the Cadillac the race wheels on the Cadillac look like they've come off a CTSV. Yes, it's, it's really nicely done, and that's you know akin to Le Mans cars of uh, certainly the, the 90s when I used to watch it with the Mercedes and the BMW. Oh, the know. big GT1 cars. The GT1 cars. Yeah, yeah. Porsche started off with the Porsche 911 uh, Evo, and that all that I mean that there's a perfect example, Johnny. Actually, you brought that up. That's a cracking example. That 911 would never have been built, the 911 GT1 car, had it not been for the fact that Porsche were committing to changing over from Type 993, in Porsche speak, by the way, you always say for the model 911, 962, 
928, whereas for the iteration, it's 993, 986, etc. It's very important that okay. for people who are um, so inclined uh, and do things Porsche, but well, that's how the factory see it, so good enough for them, good enough for us. So the 993, which was the air-cooled and oil-cooled engine, was being replaced with a, a water cooled engine in the 99 what became the 996 uh, the one with sort of fried egg headlights on the front and if you remember the gt1 and subsequently the gt1 evo uh, 911 had that front end and i think about the only parts it shared with the road car although of course they built a supercar for road use uh, as the regulations demanded. But I think it was the headlights, the front subframe, uh, and the rear lights were about all that came from the quote unquote donor car. But all of that came about because Type 996 was coming out. It was a huge change for Porsche, uh, a huge investment in a new car. The 993 had come from a development of the previous version the 964 but the 996 was so much different and of course it had that water cooled engine the current cousin of that car currently battling for leading GT Le Mans gets a bit of a draft from the WeatherTech car but even getting right under the back of the BMW still Lawrence Van Ter be, right, hang on hello this is Lawrence to Pitt can I go to military settings now in terms of me power? I want 105% <laughs> from the 4.2 engine. But that's where those that's where those GT1s came from, Johnny. And so, you know, that was... We had the uh, CLK, the wonderful CLK, which looked like it had been dropped from outer space. Yeah. Uh, and all of those cars, the Mercedes, the Porsche et al. Toyota. Oh, Toyota GT1. How beautiful was that thing? Never had any luck, but yeah, it was a great looking car, certainly. And of course, we had the Dar 962 as well, didn't we? They managed to convince the ACO they were producing a road going version of the venerable Porsche 962, carbon fibre monocoque, and uh, produced a road car ish. Pit stop four, the Dane Cameron driven, number six Acura, and uh, that's pit stops being watched by Dai. Yes, Simon Pagino, I've, 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 it's interesting that I've watched him. Every time he's ready to get into the car, he's prepared about 15 minutes before and just standing, waiting with his helmet on. So Simon has just jumped into the car, taken over from Dane Cameron. Full service here, tyres and fuel, and the car, very swift stop as usual, and that takes, it makes its way back out onto the track. I'm John Heindorf, sometime race driver, and I approve Sebastian Bordier's method of getting ready for the car 15 minutes absolute minimum absolute minimum yeah just to get acclimatized really into your new surroundings because it's not the most comfortable things having a race helmet on is it and uh, you know just to allow a little bit of air to go through with the visor up before you then get into a really hot race car I always like to I mean I'm of a certain age obviously so I'm not as lithe and fit as most of these racing drivers uh, but I like to get down stretch bend your knees, get right down into a hunkered down position and then stretch out and then bend down and then stretch out and then sit down somewhere, close my eyes. Probably the only thing at that point that I don't have on is my gloves, yeah. just in case I have to adjust something on my helmet or whatever. Keep, keep pushing at my helmet to make sure that I've got A, my balaclava on and B, my radio earpiece is in. Because that is always my big fear that I forgot to put a balaclava on on my radio earpiece as you get in the car and go, oh. What do I do now? Yeah. Hand signals, mate. So out of the International Horseshoe, GTLM got really close coming through turn six. I thought that was Lawrence Van Tour's best opportunity. This Porsche looks good further and further into the stint. So a question of not losing heart when the black BMW is disappearing up the road because Van Tour must know that the 912 is going to come good later on. And into turn six it goes. Yeah, BMW maybe slightly more cleanly through that left-hander and back up onto the banking. Still punching out of turn six really well, the big beamer. 
and through goes the Mazda number 55 on the high side with Ryan Hunter rear driving. Uh, I think, how far are we into the stints? Not that far, are we? What have we got? We're on, those guys are on lap 537. Well, they've done 20 laps. I just think the BMW start to lose its rear tyres. It's marginal, but just looking at the body language of that car, and Lawrence Vanter will be looking at that as well, and he'll want to be right with that BMW in all the big braking areas. It's under braking rather than acceleration, Johnny, that I'm noticing the back end of the BMW starting to get a little loose, a little squirrely. They're coming down to turn one now. Big, big move from Vanto. He can take a wider line and turn it in. Yeah, definitely. The BMW just not getting the breaking into the corner. Going to go straight down to the pits. Dane Cameron now with Diana Biggs. Dane, you've just jumped out from your stint. Just tell me, how much work are you doing behind the wheel to adjust anything that you need to with the changing conditions? Um, really not too much adjusting uh, for us. We're still just really touching, uh, struggling with this touching, bottoming. Uh, it's, it's pretty unbearable inside the car, to be honest. Uh, you're just getting the hell beat out of you pretty much all the way around the place. Um, yeah, so we've kind of gone to a bit shorter stints because we, we just can't really stand it, to be honest. Yeah, we did wonder that some of the stints were being shortened by a lot of the teams, and we wondered what might be going on. Yeah, it's, I mean, we're, when I first got in the car and once, and one stint at the beginning, the car was, was really good. Uh, we were in top three, no problem. Very happy with the balance. And, um, yeah, just, now the thing is just basically bouncing up and down like a, like a pogo stick around the entire racetrack. So I'm not sure if we've, you know, maybe gone to the point now or maybe failed a damper or something. So, um, is it a bit frustrating when it gets to that point when you can't quite see, you know, work out what it is? I mean, you've got an idea, clearly. Yeah, I mean, we know what we know what causes it, but you can't do anything about it in the middle of the race. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if um, if we're really lucky. Maybe when the, the temperature comes back up, usually it kind of uh, can go away. So if nothing's if nothing's really wrong, wrong, then uh, hopefully it'll start to recede a little bit. Uh, with warmer weather, but um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, as far as the race is concerned, uh, a good amount of damage has been done to, uh, to us in the standing, so we'll see where it shakes out. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. So close for GTLM. And, uh, and, uh, and Laurent Vantel rather trying to get now level with the BMW. He's got to do it before the King. He can't do it because <laughs> the 24 BMW's got the inside line, but that was the closest Vantor has got to the lead of GTLM. And that came from the BMW struggling under braking at turn one. I thought I saw a little bit of lack of grip under braking from that BMW as the Number 10, Cadillac of Renga van der Zande streaks by. Was that the number five, actually? Well, very difficult to tell the Mustang sampling and the Konica cars, Konica Minolta cars, uh, apart underneath the lights. I just think that's getting worse. It's only under braking. It's still got great traction off the corner, jo yeah, yeah. Johnny. But the back end of the car just seems a little recalcitrant. It, what it looks like is the front end washing out, but it's all coming from the fact that the back end of the car... It's just a, a little loose under braking, and it was in turn one last time around that Jesse Kron struggled a little bit, and Fantour will be kicking himself that he couldn't make that stick. Uh, by the way, the lap before that, Jordan Taylor out on new tyres in fourth place now for GTLM in the Corvette. On his out lap, on cold tyres, had those two leaders putting a lap on him with the BMW going to the left-hand side, round the outside into the west hairpin. And <laughs> Porsche of uh, Lawrence Vanter were diving down the inside of him to the right-hand side. Jordan's like, what? Ah, ah. <laughs> what? Uh, I'll oh. go left. No, no, I can't go left. I'll go right. No, I can't go that way either. I'll just sit in the middle, get my ears boxed for a little while and hope that the tyres come in soon enough. Really interesting comments, I thought, from Dave Cameron as yes. well, from Diana Binks. I mean, that is so un-Penske-like to have cars 
bouncing up and down like pogo sticks. He admits it's got worse through the course of the race. Maybe the daylight hours will make it better. Uh, but they're having to shorten the stints because it is so unbearable. That's horrible for the number six car. Well, we can hear it from the onboard, and you will feel that. That'll be horrible for the driver. The other question that I've got is what about a ride height measurement at the end of the race? What is it grinding down? Yes. Uh, and how is that going to affect the likelihood of that car in post-race tech being sanctioned by the IMSA technical team. <clears throat> Sorry, by the IMSA technical team. I didn't need to go the technical team <laughs> at that point. But yeah, they're, they're big question marks and uh, you know they're only going to know that when the measurement is taken, if indeed they manage to get to the end of the race with that and the car doesn't tear itself apart before then. But scraping particularly at those high speeds, is never good. And that movement, longitudinal movement, basically, from the front to the back of the car, <laughs> what we call it porpoising, where it's bouncing up and down. We've seen it from, was it the Porsches that were doing that, uh, the uh, GT cars earlier on in the week, as I think they were toying with ride height and front splitter settings. Talking about drivers getting ready uh, earlier on and how long you do it, Alex Brown said, uh, we did the... HSF Foundation, uh, Henry Surtees Foundation kart race last year. One of our drivers uh, lost their gloves just before the stint. Got in the kart anyway with another set of gloves and halfway through notices how uncomfortable his helmet was. Guess where the gloves were? Oh no, wedged in the side of his, the side of his head. Just, yeah, oh, or, or on, on top, top of, oh, even okay. worse. Yes. And so then the chin bar is actually up by your eyes and it looks like you feels like you're looking at through a letterbox set. Uh, leading car, Johnny in GTT back in the pit lanes. Andrea Caldarelli is out of that car. And I didn't get the binoculars on it quickly enough to see who got in. But I think from the rotation, it should be Madison Snow, shouldn't it? Who gets into that car? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, Caldarelli must have done big. Puff of tyre smoke there to Great try and stints light. by Caldarelli, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To try and light up those rear tyres and get them to temperature as quickly as possible, but it's going to be tippy-toe stuff for the first few corners. Caldarelli, double stint at least. And at least Cali twice... Uh, sorry, Johnny. At least twice lowered the best lap for that car. Uh, was impressive. Uh, and just waiting for... That car to go out. It is indeed Madison Snow. That cup of coffee that I had has just started to get the old grey matter ticking over again. Merca Bortolotti, by the way, followed the lead in GTD in that 88. Audi is in second position. About 52 seconds. Got about 17 seconds on Spencer Pompelli in third. Pat Long yet to come through. That was uh, Vantor nearly taking the nose off Madison Snow's Lamborghini as he turned left because Madison's struggling on the cold tyres. Correct. He kept left, but the Porsche swung by from the right and uh, so, so close to contact being made. I think Vantor was just about on the dimension, dimensions of his car and how close he was. But again, not a moment to lose to the BMW in front. And again, we're in a phase where the BMW is just able to inch away, mainly because it's out of turn six, where the M8 is so strong. Can't wait to hear it from Lawrence Vanto at the end of his stint. I'm sure he's enjoying this. He'll look back on it when he gets out of the car and enjoy it, perhaps. I think he's a bit frustrated now. He can't get a little bit closer. I wonder if he... <sighs> Do we think he's been held up, though, Johnny? I don't think he is, is he? It's it questionable about whether the Porsche could go a little bit faster on the infield, but certainly not on the high banks and the straights. Second-place car in for Sebastian Bordier in the Mustang sampling number five. Is this an opportunity for the Porsche? Because there are some now some prototypes that need to get by the BMW, and if they can force the hole, maybe just put the BMW off its stride a little bit, and the Porsche might be there, but it's not going to be close enough into the international horseshoe. One more prototype to get by, which is an LMP2 car. Well, it might put the BMW offline into the kink, where 
Yes, he Kron and that M8 GTE are very strong indeed. Uh, strong enough to keep the prototype behind it, in fact. That's commitment from Kron. And Lawrence Vanto knows that he has to be close and take any opportunity that is presented. I think the Porsche might be just a little bit stronger towards the end of the stint, but is it strong enough? What we do know, if this comes down to a, a scrap out of NASCAR, well, out of the bus stop and then through NASCAR turns three and four, even if the Porsche is ahead by then, we've seen the BMW drag past by the line and get its not inconsiderable BMW nose ahead of the slightly less snouty Porsche 912. Here we go. GTD car in the way and the BMW trying to get around the outside of the 47. Really close God. indeed in GTLM. But once more, BMW finds clear air and just edges away. It's about four or five car lengths when it was absolutely nothing in the bus stop. That was really smart driving by Jesse Kron because he's he... Coming in. he oh, he's in the pits, right. He he actually made Vanto lift there. Yeah. Vanto couldn't keep it in, he came so far up. Now, Vanto, he can't be up too far away from his pit stop either because they came on, on the same lap last time around. So Vanto's going a bit longer. Now, hot tyres now, does he get the advantage of that? He's got to put an absolute corker of a lap in right now. If he gets a good enough lap here, the call will be to pit. Oh, he's had to make way for... Now, that is the race number leader. 10. Yeah, race leader of Renke van der Zander. So, Vanto's got to put the lap of his life in here in the 9-1-2. Yes, he crawled in the pit lane. I didn't... I was so excited about seeing a bit of clear air from the Porsche. I forgot to look to see if there was a driver change on the... Black BMW. They are pulling tyres yeah. out at RLL and... Oh, they're doing brakes! Oh! Right, brakes on the BMW, so they might as well do a full stint. Tyres coming off, actually, look pretty good. Yes, they do. Mind, we're on the other side of the track, but... So, I wonder, with a bit of top-up of fluids for the BMW as well, that looks like oil going in under pressure as well. It's normally red for oil and blue for water for most of the teams. Well, I wonder if what Yessi was struggling with then wasn't rear grip, but actually brakes that were going off a little bit as they come down towards what... I'm quite surprised GT Le Mans cars would need to do a brake... St uh, brake stop here. It was... Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, they normally take 38, 40 seconds. And including a full set of new brake discs, rotors and pads, four wheels and t Michelin tyres, uh, and a top of a fuel, 90 seconds on the ground. Yeah. 90 seconds stopped. Yeah, mightily impressive. Wow. The question is, though, does the Porsche need to change brakes? Because uh, all of a sudden, the BMW is at a massive disadvantage now that it's taken that extra time. However, it will give it an advantage in terms of stopping. Uh, will that force Porsche into a decision to also change some rotors? Maybe they think, no, that they are fine to the finish on the ones they started with. Well, how long... Let's have a look, Johnny, at how long that stint was, because I just wonder if Vanto was forced in early because the Porsche and the BMW stopped on the same lap last time and, uh, and the time before that in fact so they've been right. matching each other's every move and this is the change around if you like 912 staying out again in comes the race leader in DPI though car number 10 which is the Renga van der Zander machine BMW Team RLL, 29 laps, that last stint for the 24 car, and that's what it's been doing, 29, 30 laps. 30 laps now, though, for the 9-1-2. Nick Tandy's been in after 29 laps. He came in, what, uh, four laps ago. 
9.12 is in the, what was the second place car in GTLM, but of course Diana Binks it's just come in now from the lead of the race in that class. Yeah, the car has just arrived on the pit apron, it's all four tyres are being changed, no brake disc to be changed at the moment, just refuelling the fuel hose is on, they've just dropped the car back down onto the apron, cleaning the windscreen and making a couple of adjustments, just cleaning the front grill. Um, far, car has fired up, you can probably hear that. They're just finishing the fuel. That so, was a lovely noise, wasn't it? It was, yeah, very different from last year's Porsche, but uh, it uh, gets underway. And whilst that was happening, and Bixi giving us a report from Pitt in, the race leader in DPI was also being serviced. Renga van der Zander, as I mentioned, bringing that number 10 car in. Not sure whether they did a driver change, but uh, all will become clear as soon as the car returns to the track and goes through the timing loop now. They did I, not. I don't think they did. No, they didn't. So the so Dutchman staying at the wheel. Did get a new set of Michelins, though. I'm fairly certain I saw those going on the car. Well, another set of Michelins. What I can't tell you is whether they were brand new. Only 38 sets, remember, for the whole of race week from free practice one to the chequered flag. He's got out though uh, without losing the lead, like Duval, yet to complete lap 580. Thirty-eight sets of tyres we were talking about. The lead has already done twenty-eight pit stops. And they've been, I don't think they've had any stops that weren't required. So if they've changed on every stop, they've, even if they had a full set of tyres, they would have only had 10 sets left. One penalty, wasn't there, for uh, speeding in the pit lane ah, by Ashley very early on. Well remembered. Um, and I'd, I've been away for three hours, so I don't know what happened in that spell. But I think actually it's been pretty metronomic since then. Um, they oh there was a worry that Jer Jeremy said that they might have done a, an early stint but it's because they actually short fueled the 10 and the 31 in order to be ahead for the six, six hour, hour awarding um, of points yeah so he was able to allay any fears there that uh, the car was struggling for it for whatever reason Ricky Taylor aboard the rebuilt Acura number seven has just put that car's fastest first sector in Merkel bought a lot, he's pushing hard in the Audi in third position. This is the 88 car. He's just done that car's best final stint of the race so far. Proving those two drivers, there's still time to be found out there. Lawrence Van Tour having pitted, resumes in the lead, of course, and now is in second place, yet to go through and complete the lap on which Lawrence Van Tour is already Nick Tandy there he goes it's 21 seconds Tandy to Lawrence Van Tour. well he got that down to 10.7 seconds so I wonder if Tandy didn't change tyres last time around he's he stopped six laps before his teammates Maybe that's something we can find out the long pit stop for Jesse Crone in the BMW allows Corvette number three with Jordan Taylor up into third position. And now only three and a half seconds, Johnny, behind the two, well, behind the second of the two Porsches anyway, as the leader is back on the high banks with, for once, a little bit of breathing space between himself and the traffic ahead as he comes through the tri-oval. Miles Cook very much enjoying the coverage on IMSA Radio, by the way, tweeting to uh, at... IMSA Radio using the hashtag IMSA Radio D24. Uh, coverage particularly compulsive this year, he says. Quick question, watching the brake change just now, are the teams allowed to use pre-bedded in pads and discs? Almost certainly the teams will have done that as part of their prep. Yes. So they'll either do that on a test day, uh, because what you want to do is match a set of pads to the racing discs. They use quite exotic components even on the GT Le Mans cars now. I don't think they're using steel discs anymore. Haven't been for a while. Uh, and what you'll do is you'll put a set of discs on and put the first set of pads in. Might even bed a second pair of pads, set of pads, 
into the same discs. Depends what your life is. Probably wouldn't bother doing that for the backs because they don't wear as much. But you might go through two sets of pads to one set of carbon carbon fronts. So good this question. This place is pretty brutal on brakes, there, isn't there's it? A, there's a few big stops, yeah. Yeah. And, and historically, I, I I have seen brake changes in this race. It's perhaps a strange time to do it at, at two thirds of the way in, but that's maybe just a feeling from from a driver saying ah, it's really I'm really struggling to get the car stopped now into the big hairpins, but. Uh, also, I mean, oh. run down the back straight into the bus stop. You're not slowing to quite the speed you would negotiate the horseshoes to, but nevertheless, the brake discs glowing red hot and also that hard stop into turn one, of course. Yes, he Kron's just done the number 24, Rahal Letterman Lanigan BMW M8 GTE's fastest lap of the race, 142.6. That's a good second quicker than the two cars ahead and a second and a half quicker than the leader. Lawrence Van Toor. Very relaxed behind the wheel. Another driver who likes this bent arm position. You see his fingers working the paddles. It is literally one finger on the shift paddles. One of the things I noticed from the onboards earlier in the week with Kyle Busch, who I've been tremendously impressed by. I think we all have. I mean, we know he's a great driver. He's really represented stock car racing very well this week, given lots of interviews. Uh, nickname is Rowdy. That uh, would indicate the reputation that he has in his own sport. He's been calm cousin Kyle this week brilliant stuff for the NASCAR champion he uses all four fingers to change gear to the point where he's almost taking his hand off to stretch around right. all four fingers as if there's a huge, am huge amount of effort uh, in that I don't know whether he's just not used to it or he just prefers it that way because that's what he wants to get the, the right feel on it it's nothing worse than a set of paddles that don't give you any tactile feedback, I think. But he's been mighty in that car, really attacking the corners. So for anybody who would say, oh, well, you know, they can only turn left, these NASCAR drivers, think again. Think again. This is a man who's come out of a three-and-a-half-thousand-pound car, £3,500, with probably... Six and a half, seven hundred horsepower with no traction control, no ABS, and a four speed stick shift gearbox with three pedals into. And the Lexus probably doesn't weigh too much different. What we got 1200, 1300 kilos times that by two and a quarter, so a little bit lighter, nowhere near the power. Traction control and ABS, which you have to be able to use and manage as the tyre life changes and as the fuel load changes. Plus, by the way, two pedals, paddle shift gearbox. I can't imagine that in his NASCAR, he does a lot of left foot braking, but you almost have to in these GT cars. Another good run through the tri-oval for Jesse Kron. Uh, Binksy has been, do been doing some investigating work, by the way, for the 911, and they did take all four tyres right. for Nick Tandy. So, Well, his time last time around was a 43-1. That was a tenth quicker than his teammate in the lead. But he's been closed down, Johnny, by Jordan Taylor. And yeah, three tenths that time around, half a second the lap before. It's down to two seconds, that gap between Porsche 911 in second and Corvette in third position with Jordan Taylor at the wheel. Out on the track, Felipe Fraga in the sixth place, Mercedes-AMG GT3. 
It's the Ranch Resort car. One of a number of cars. This is a Riley Engineering, of course. Bill Riley looking after this effort. One of a number of cars that doesn't have a rear view mirror or has a rear view mirror, but has as an addition a rearward mounted and pointing camera. Well, that's not new. No. But adopting the technology that Corvette has had for a little while now of proximity sensors on the back. You have them on your car, the sort of thing that flashes on your wing mirror if somebody's there. Well, this is a slightly more clever version of that and works particularly well in the dark. It automatically adjusts so that the headlights don't blind the camera. And then it will give you a graphic representation of how quickly the car behind you is gaining and where it is and which side it is. Because when you look through your rear view mirror and there's a G and there's a prototype car coming with its headlights on full, all you can see is white. Yeah, so very useful to have that little reference point. Uh, I think normally at the bottom of the screen, whereby uh, it, uh, I think that is it an is it like a little arrow that gro grows gets bigger grows bigger, bigger as yeah. it's getting closer to you, and it'll show which side it reckons you're going to pass. It's yeah. magnificent. It really I mean, is. That's not even off the sort of simulator uh, um, computer games. That's off the arcade. It's great gaming stuff, isn't it? And uh, yeah, remember that being on touring car games of old and now being utilised in real life. Josh Barrett's been in touch at IMSA Radio with the hashtag IMSA Radio D24. Not sure if something happened to the number 31 Whelan car. A couple of hours ago, it was challenging Mustang sampling, fell behind the Mazda, now slowly dropping away, and a lap down for the 31 car. Uh, not quite. Uh, yes, just a lap down. You're right, Josh. In the same part of the circuit as the leader. Leader's just gone across the line to complete 587. Uh, Philippe Nasser will come round to complete 586 round about now. So, yes, you're right, just off the lead lap. Now, what I can't work out is who owes us a pit stop. Last in in 573, we're working lap 588 for the leader. He's been out for seven laps so some 7 uh, no not that many yeah 7 laps difference 8 laps difference between when they pitted down off the bank it goes the number 12 Lexus that's RCS. Townsend Bell yep at one stage, I think we had Townsend Ben and AJ Allmendinger out on the track, both of the NBC Sports commentators who are pulling double duty in the booth and in the car. I really think somebody from radio should do that. I do. I had a feeling you might. Anybody got a licence? <laughs> Just reach down into that front yes, pocket. Yes, I know. Yeah, you've shown me before. <laughs> Uh, I'm getting the message. Really? It appears nobody else is. No, well, that's a. Th <laughs> you need to work harder, JP. Okay. Really. <laughs> In your absence, whilst you go knocking on the, the back of uh, garage doors to Chris see, uh, to see who has, who's got the available seat. I think it might be a bit too late for this year. Yeah, true. Keep working. Chris Miller for Cadillac into the pit lane in the 85 JDC Machina. Right, Tandy's picked up his pace a bit. He's under 20 seconds away from the leader. He has to because Jordan Dale is right there. He's lost three seconds last time around. 2.8 seconds between the Corvette number three and Nick Tandy in the 911. It's a battle we need to keep an eye on. GTD, Madison Snow. Installed at the last pit stop for Paul Miller Racing ahead of Mirko Bortolotti in the Audi number 88. Then the 44 Magnus Racing, Andy Lally. Lamborghini, another 50 seconds further back. And Andy has got about a minute, just under a minute, 
and Klaus Backler, I reckon, who is next up for Porsche, number 16. That's the right motorsport car. Right, remember the team who donated, it said in the press release, their shell to Black Swan, who are in the top ten. Sven Muller behind the wheel. They were in the top six for a little while. They are now five laps. Three laps behind the leader. Oh, hello. Is that Ryan Hunter Ray in the pit? Yes, it is. In the 55 Mazda. And already out, in fact. Yeah. So heading now towards that very narrow pit lane exit road. Seven hours, nine minutes still to go. And that car coming in from fifth position with the gap behind. It's a lap to the Acura number six with all their problems with the porpoising so won't lose a position with the Mazda 55 rejoining as Townsend Bell having to put in quite a bit of, of steering input sometimes not necessarily in the direction of the corner going into the international horseshoe but I noticed Carl Busch has a similar driving style mm. that's maybe just how the Lexus is set up it's a, it's a biggish car and uh, if having to you know, have to get, get a fair bit of rotation sorted into the braking area and then arrest the slide. 14 cars just been overtaken by the number six, uh, Simon Pagino driven Acura to stick another lap on that Lexus. In comes Tristan Nunes from third position in the 77 Mazda. That's the white, mostly white Mazda. This will be his 28th pit stop, 29th pit stop, may that. It's Kyle Busch has a Ricci Ferrari for company. Being driven at the moment by James Collado, 30 seconds back from fourth position, which is Jesse Kron, who has led for BMW. Brake change, dropping him out of the lead. Planned brake change, I should say. Well, looked like it anyway. Still on the lead lap, I reckon, is Sir James Collado. It's about a minute and 24, well, let's say 90 seconds behind the class leader. And a lap time around here takes you about 102 seconds. So within that envelope that is required to retain the lead lap. So all four manufacturers in GTLM still represented in the fight, I would say. 20 odd seconds between the two Porsches, Vantor leading Tandy, Je uh, Jordan Taylor who took over the Corvette, the last stop, uh, 2.9 seconds further back. So that's the fight to focus on now, is uh, Taylor versus Tandy for second position. And in GTD, Madison Snow leads for Paul Miller Racing in the Lamborghini Huracan ahead of Audi R8, Merco Bortolotti, that's the WRT Speed Star Audi. GRT Magnus's Huracan now just heading towards the chicane. Rattling over the curbs there. Plenty of tyre pickup just offline. That's getting more and more, as you would expect, down the long straight where the uh, bits of Michelin rubber that are worked loose on the turns are then flung from the tyre down the long straight. Andy Lally doing a good job, though, in that third place to GT. Daytona car, fourth place class Backler for the Wright Motorsports Porsche crew and in fifth position Felipe Fraga in his number 74 Riley Motorsports Mercedes, the thundering 6.2 litre V8 which uh, is in the front of that Merck. Another five and a half minutes to go and we will have reached the end of another race hour then and that will leave us with seven hours still to go. Again, Townsend Bell turning left and right and right and left through the bus stop. I've done this bit of track before, he thinks. Threading my eye of the needle. I was thinking about Carl Busch coming through the tri-oval. I wonder how many times earlier on in the week he 
had to remember to turn left. Yes, and more, brick. More left than normal yes. at turn one. Yeah. I mean, there is a giant amber arrow at this time of night, which is constantly reminding people you've got to turn left here on onto the road course, but so used he will be to heading down to Speedway turn one. He's to go to skill with a girl called Amber Arrow. Did no you? interest in archery at all, sadly. What a disappointment yep. to all the family. Van Tor, Tandy, Taylor, top three in GTLM. The, the uh, V10-powered cars looking very strong in GT Daytona currently, with a Lamborghini, an Audi, and another Huracan represented there. Rear engine Porsche, unlike the GTLM cars, then comes next with uh, Klaus Backler, who is 28 years old now from Austria, but uh, a real mean driver. Turned up at the Portimao 24 hours last year and surprised a lot of people who didn't really know a great deal about him in the uh, 24H Series se uh, um, Championship. He was a bit of a superstar there, but uh, yeah, mightily impressive in Porsche GT cars now, having come through the Carrera Cup ranks through the chicane then goes the number 10 of Renga van der Zander leading by a minute and 11 seconds now so how many cars can he put off the lead lap during this stint I wonder that's the question only another 30 seconds in order to find on Loic Duval to be a, a full lap of a lap ahead of everybody yeah there's only the top two as you rightly say Johnny the number 10 Conning and Minolta Cadillac and the five Mustang sampling machine from JDC. Yeah, he's about a segment behind, so 30, 31 seconds, spot on. It's been a great drive for Renga. Into the pits for the Aim Vassa Sullivan Lexus number 12. So that was Townsend Bell, wasn't it, that we had in there? And again, more oil going, being added in under pressure. Uh, have the tyres on. Down it goes. Wait for the fuel. Pretty purposeful car, isn't it? That uh, Lexus with the wide arch kit on it. Wow, long fill. 42 seconds already. Yes, the RCF is uh, used in things like Super GT as well, and it's even more flared and uh, radical, but uh, a, a neat and tidy-looking GT3 car, certainly. Yeah, we're great. Um, more of a sort of sedan, really, a family-looking uh, car. You know, it's uh, akin to the M8 in the GTLM category, uh, but uh, that's the beauty of balance of performance. You can have a car that looks quite boxy up against the Lamborghini and an Audi with the lower slung roof line, uh, but it still can be competitive, as has been proven with uh, both the 12 and the 14. They were up against it a little bit earlier on in the week. Full engine change for the it was a 14, wasn't it, that uh, took a long, long time to get that power plant out and the new one in. It meant that that car wasn't able to qualify and they also had uh, underfloor problems for the number 12 as well, possibly related to the newish curb at the bus stop chicane that was actually installed between the Raw before the 24 and the main event. But everybody has adjusted uh, ride height settings accordingly to make sure that their cars can be competitive once again. James Collado, 62 Ferrari, fifth position for that car, about to again go a lap down on the overall leader, but Collado trying to stay in touch with Jesse Krohn, still about 31 seconds adrift in his Risi Competizione Ferrari, the 488 GTE. Just the first signs of a little bit of red in the sky over towards the ocean. The 13 hours and 21 minutes from sunset to sunrise. About to come to an end as we complete another hour of racing. 107.9 around the circuit. RS2, IMSA Radio across the, UA, uh, the USA and around the world. 
Scotland here in the US, Sirius 216 XM202. We're live from trackside at the Daytona International Speedway. Joining the conversation in IMSA Radio, hashtag IMSA Radio.